Welcome to another episode of Kicking It in the Second Half. Today we are doing the next episode based off yesterday's Eastern Conference predictions. We're doing the Western Conference predictions. Which teams are kicking it in the second half and which teams are getting kicked in the second half? I'm D, back with Groot. Hugh, say what's up. What's up, people? Congratulations on the win. I see you rocking the UVA over there. Yes, sir. All right, no, no comment. Okay, and <laughs> with us again, we got another special guest. Actually, the same special guest as yesterday. I guess we did it right yesterday, and now he wants to come back again and, and hit it with the Western Conference. Uh, like I said, we know him as B. Professionally, he is known as your bud 36. Say what up, B. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, I'm hey. back again. Excited what are you to rocking be. tonight, buddy? Uh, got the, the blue retro LA jersey tonight. Uh, just to look at the Western Conference, figure I should put something Western oriented on. And uh, I got rid of my cowboy hat. So what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? You find something that works. Today I got on the Pelicans. Shout out to the Pelicans. Um, yeah, let's start with the rundown of the Western Conference standings today. Uh, Hugh, give us that. Uh, all right. Uh, first is Utah. Second is Phoenix. Third is the Lakers. Fourth is the Clippers. Fifth is the Trailblazers, sixth the Nuggets, seventh the Spurs, eighth the Mavs, ninth the Grizzlies, tenth the Warriors, eleventh the Pelicans, twelfth uh, Oklahoma City, third Sacramento, thirteenth, excuse me, fourteenth uh, Houston Rockets, and fifteenth Minnesota Timberwolves. Yeah, if, uh, I know you just listed the uh, the standings, but uh, without any regards of uh, mentioning their win percentages or they're actually uh, their actual win to uh, to losses there but looking at the records um, you know on paper as far as what y'all can see you know we would have to say most of these teams are in a tight race you know especially in the middle of the pack there and the ones that are right outside of the uh, playoffs you know it fluctuates basically week to week with a lot of these teams when you're talking about the western conference there's no clear cut from most of these teams like getting in um, at a certain number uh, when it comes to seating. Um, but first, you know, let's make it easy on us. Let's talk about who do y'all think just basically are at the bottom as far as not making it at all. Like they have no hope for this second half of making the playoffs. B, what do you have? Uh, I mean, obviously uh, you gotta look at Minnesota. It's been abysmal. Uh, between the COVID, uh, between everything going on uh, in that organization, it's it's a mess. It's not even a rebuild. It's just everything is in disarray. Uh, I mean, not even double-digit wins at halfway point. It's just – it's disheartening uh, to see how much potential they had uh, but only a couple of years ago to what what they have now. It's just – I don't know what, what they do, but I definitely don't see them making any progress uh, going forward. Yeah, the direction, they don't know which way is up. I mean, you have Carl Anthony, and then, uh, okay, do you build with that? Add in D'Angelo Russell. Did that make your team any better? Draft number one, okay, is he your go-to guy? Uh, where are you going to end out at this at the end of this season, going into the next season, you know, the thoughts that they're going to have to – go over and, and ponder as far as how do they either rebuild or do, how do they build to become better uh, for next season. But it's just like one way they're looking up and another way they're looking down and just everything's going past them uh, pretty fast. They did fire their coach at one part, point during the season. And it's just it just looks like they're misguided and need some footing but don't know where to find that. Is that the only team right now that you're looking at as uh, seriously um, a team that has no hope at all? Or is there another team out there that you think also kind of fits in that uh, realm as far as seeding for the end of the regular season? Uh, I also, I, I don't think Sacramento has uh, anything that you can really rely on consistently. Um, 
I mean, they have some some players, so they're in a slightly better position than Minnesota, but I feel like they're in the same situation as Chicago. There's no guy you go to in the clutch. There's just a couple of guys who have some skill, but they're really second or third options in a really good team. And uh, I don't know what they do. I don't know what they can move. And I don't see them being able to make a move in order to improve their standing. Uh, like I say, I don't know what they are. I don't think they know what they are. And I look for them to stay pretty much at the position they are. I would agree with that. Um, in a way, what we were talking about earlier before we started recording, it's almost like Darren Fox is kind of like the Western Conference version of Zach Levine, uh, borderline an all-star type of player when it comes to numbers and what he does for the team, but maybe not enough to just carry alone and need some firepower and just needs to be on, on a different team um, with maybe a secondary role. Hugh, what are your thoughts about the Houston Rockets? Are they a team that should be climbing this year or they should just keep doing what they're doing and try for the best in the off season and into next year? No, uh, D, I'm actually happy that you brought up that team because that was actually the team I was uh, going to discuss. Um, I think Houston, has absolutely no hope the rest of this year. I would have them going uh, dead last in that conference if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for the Timberwolves being so bad. But uh, Houston, you know, they uh they released uh, Demarcus Cousins, and that was I thought Demarcus Cousins was actually uh, playing very well for them. You know, with when Christian Wood missed some time due to injury, I thought Boogie stepped in and was doing great. But um, you know, they obviously released him. I got his touch on you know. Christian Wood missed some time with injury, so that's one reason the record's so low. But, uh, you know, now Victor Oladipo, like we discussed a couple of episodes ago, is on the trading block. Uh, so expect him to, to leave and uh, get shipped somewhere else. You know, John Wall, uh, you know, I like John Wall. I'm very high on him, but it's like he plays a game, misses a game. He's uh, not very consistent when it comes to playing. We all know his injury history. But, uh, yeah, I just Houston, I just have been hanging out at the bottom the rest of the year. They need to make some moves, in my opinion, in the offseason to become relevant again. Yeah, just touching up on what you're saying about some of those players. Um, and also just to compare when you mentioned Houston Rockets being at the bottom versus the Minnesota Timberwolves, uh, just to let the listeners know, right now Houston is sitting at a record of 11 wins to 23 losses, and the Timberwolves are at seven wins with 29 losses. So not a huge difference there. But um, a, a player like DeMarcus Cousins – Yeah, they had him there, you know, beneficial to their team as far as a backup center and also beneficial to him to kind of show that, you know, he's still able to play and contribute on a team in the NBA, but obviously a player that they probably wouldn't get any value from as far as on the trade market. So letting him go is probably the best bet for his career and for them. And I'm sure he'll be picked up by some type of contending team after they filter through some of these other bigs uh, that, you know, will definitely go elsewhere via trade or um, or through a buyout. I mean, Andre Drummond, like we mentioned yesterday, is a big name to watch out for. But, but yeah, and then you have uh, Victor Oladipo, who, you know, will be involved in some type of trade. You know, he was up front telling them here recently that he doesn't want to uh, stay with the team. So it's, it is best, you know, I guess to hear directly from your players so you don't have to wonder what to do with this contract or, or let them go for free. So, you know, move on from him and get what you can to uh, build for your future. And then also uh, John Wall, you know, they might be stuck with him for a little bit. Uh, It's going to be hard to find a suitor for him because it was hard for the Wizards to find a suitor when when they had him. So not too many teams that's going to be asking or knocking at the door for for him, but he could still stay there and because they're going to need a point guard. But definitely Christian Wood is the guy that looks like – you know, he's the mainstay. They signed him for a reason, no different than maybe a Jeremy Grant type of player being uh, signed to, you know, the Pistons in the offseason. Oh, another mention, uh, P.J. Tucker. Yeah, he's going to be out as well. He's going to be, I guess, in the buyout market and uh, on a contending team. We touched up on him the other day as well. But, um, yeah, just looking at the roster, the vets are just there either as fillers or – or until they find some other suitors, but they're definitely going young. They got some young talent that they can definitely develop, but definitely the number one option uh, for the time being will be Christian Wood. 
as he makes his return from his injury and he is doing very well. So there's no doubt about having him there as your number one option right now, because he's putting up great numbers. He's great when he plays, he can basically impact the game at any time when he's on the court and help them to get the win. So having a, a player like the Marcus cousins who could potentially, you know, run into some, um, some problems with them as far as having both of them on the court. So you would definitely want to split them up. So not having him there really won't hurt his, his uh, development as far as getting any uh, lessons and in, in training or how to, uh, how to perform in the league uh, from DeMarcus Cousins. And as far as the Rockets organization, you know, they're thankful for having him there, but even more grateful for being able to uh, secure uh, Christian Wood as their uh, head guy this past off season. But yeah, let's go on from this topic, I guess, specifically with the bottom teams into more of the mid-round teams or the play-in teams. I mean, like I said, it's so tight probably from, I mean, basically from the, the top down, but, you know, excluding some of the upper teams because they're probably more consistent. Let's start with, you know, in the middle, like a fifth seed all the way down to maybe the Pelicans. Um, I see – the uh, OKC Thunder is just a team, again, that's in rebuild, even though they're fourth from the bottom. It just looks like there's a clear direction there because they are in rebuild mo mode. They traded some players away and has a stock house of, uh, of picks. So um, there's nothing there that makes me think that, okay, this is a team that's trying to get in the into the playoffs or in the um, – the play in round. So they are where they should be in my opinion and whatever wins they come out with would be great, but nothing major going on there. I look for George Hill and or Al Horford to be traded uh, at some point before the trade deadline this year. Uh, I could be wrong, but I don't see a, a need to actually have them there when you're trying to rebuild. And clearly that's what they're trying to do. But yeah, let's try to run down uh, the middle of the pack. I want to ask both y'all at the same time. I want to give a list of, of teams that are, you know, obviously playoff type of teams, but some of them are inside of the playoffs right now and some of them are out. And like I was mentioning, it changes week to week, but just a bold prediction of where y'all think they will end up at by the end of the regular season this year. Um, as far as give me a one word answer, if you think they're going to be under their current seating over their current seating or just coasting to kind of hold on to that spot where they're at. Um, first off, the Dallas Mavericks, they're seventh. Uh, Under, over, or coasting? Say over. You? Yeah, I, I have Dallas about coasting where they are. Okay. And let's go with the Spurs. Uh, they're at uh, the eighth spot, oh, I'm sorry, they are, I, I had this wrong. Dallas was at the eighth spot and the Spurs are at the seventh spot uh, because they played each other tonight. Uh, but anyway, um, th that's close enough. But the Spurs, what do y'all think? Um, they're sitting at seventh B. Is under. that they're under or over or coasting? Yeah, under. Hugh? Yeah, I agree with B there, under. Warriors sitting at the 10th seed. Say coasting. I say over. Blazers, fifth seed. I'd say coasting again. I'm going to say over. Grizzlies, ninth seed. I say over here. I got Memphis coasting. And uh, Pelicans is last on my short list here. They're sitting at the 11th seed. Coasting, I would say. Yeah, I hate to say it, but I agree with B there, coasting. Coasting, okay. Well, um, it looks like y'all probably agree that the Mavericks uh, – are basically going to make the playoffs. 
um, let's look at let's look at the Warriors because uh, that's kind of interesting there of the over and coasting. So BU had them coasting at ten, and Hugh, you had them over. Uh, how far did you you think you might have them over? If you just had to give a <clears> quick <throat> guess today. Um. Well, for coasting, well, for the Mavs, I said coasting. I could see them going up one spot. I just pretty much consider that coasting. But uh, I could see the Warriors. I mean, if you – I know how the, the standings is right now, but if you look at their actual records, you know, they have um, one more win than the Mavs currently, one more win than the Spurs currently, and they have two more wins than the Grizzlies currently. They just uh, have played more. They haven't missed many games due to COVID. So um, they have a couple more losses as well. So, you know, I mean, one game uh, could shift that. I just have the Warriors. Uh, I like their their chances. I like Wiseman developing. I think he's getting better as the season goes along. I think uh, uh, Kelly Oubre is definitely playing a lot better than he was. Um, you know, Steph uh, is doing Steph things. You know, Draymond's, uh, you know, uh, tossing the ball around uh, like he always does. And I just, I just think they can maybe get to that A spot there. B, what's your follow-up to that? You had them coasting in the 10th seat. Uh, I think that uh, they're they're performing um, over expectations currently, in my opinion. Uh, I think that the fact that they're not down at the bottom is a testament to how good Curry and Draymond are. Um, Ubre is a streaky player. I don't suspect that his great play will continue though um he tends to go on these streaks throughout his career where he'll show you a, a glimmer of of greatness and then he'll come back down to earth and then underachieve for a little while as well um i look for that to kind of do the ebb and flow um and i think Ubre is going to be the difference uh and being that he's inconsistent i would say that his inconsistency is their consistency. So I look for them to stay uh, rise or fall kind of based on whether he's playing well or not. And uh, at the end of the day, still ending up just probably right outside of that playoff rank. Um, but like I say, all, all hats off. Curry is playing at an MVP level. It's absolutely all inspiring to watch. Um, he's the best shooter I've ever seen play. Um, and it's just, it's amazing to just watch what he's capable of. Um, but in the same regard, this is a league where you need to have, you know, multiple big names, multiple big time finishers in order to finish. And I think Clay's too big of a piece to be missing to get into this highly contested Western playoff picture. Y'all both make valid points there because, you know, I could see the Warriors going up a few spots, you know, if they keep playing at the high level that they are and everybody stays healthy, then sure, why not? But then B, what you're saying, you know, coasting there in the 10th spot is not necessarily a reflection of, you know, the team being bad. It's just they're without Clay Thompson, which is a huge piece. And they could also be one injury away from, you know, either staying there or dropping down because, you know, you can't afford for stuff to get hurt in a way that will carry over into next season. So you might want to ease up if you feel like um, the the seating is starting to get away from you a little bit. Um, and then also just my take as far as with the Warriors coming in um, and, and being on fire. Uh, yeah, Steph Curry is definitely performing at an MVP level. But being at the 10th seed doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be out of the playoffs because of the, the play-in style that I think the uh, league is going to continue this year. So, yeah, if they were to stay at 10th, we could still see Steph in the playoff picture. Um, so, yeah, 10th is not a bad spot for them. But it is, it's so tight that the other week they were, I think, hovering around 5th or 6th, maybe 4th seed, as high as that. So it's something to definitely keep an eye out. Let's move on to uh, the next one y'all talked about, uh, the Blazers. Uh, B, you had them coasting, and Hugh, you had them over. But I want to start with B again uh, on this one. They're sitting at the fifth seed. Uh, I think with the pieces they have, um, they're consistently finding wins. Um, with Dame, obviously, you can't count them out um, in most competitions. 
Uh, I don't think they have enough um, star power, so to speak, to overcome uh, the Clippers, Lakers, and uh, the rejuvenated Suns and Jazz. So I think uh, that fifth spot suits them. Uh, obviously, they could take and uh, knock off one of those teams in a game or two, but I don't see it um, making any major headway push, pulling into that top four spot. Um, nothing against, like I say, their team. They have a lot of talent, and I'm big on Dame. You guys know I, I love Dame. He's super entertaining to watch, and um, he – he brings it every night, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, again, it's what I say, it's a multi-star, uh, uh, multi-stars needed to get into that top tier level, and I just don't know who you go to after Dame in order to make that push to get into like the top four, top three spots. You're right. It, it's time for CJ to keep performing at the high level that he was prior to his injury. Um, the way he started the season was definitely an improvement and something that they need. And they need uh, more players coming in and definitely uh, less injuries happening for their team. And like you said, Dame is an incredible player. And we all know when it's Dame time and we know what that means. So, Hugh, I'm asking you about the over that you predicted for them. I mean, when it's Dame time, it's Dame time, but. Is Dane Tom going to put them in the top four? You know, I uh, I think it will. I think they're going to uh, surpass the Clippers. I think the Clippers at the end are going to be the fifth seed, and I have the Trailblazers at the fourth seed. Uh, the reason I say that, I think it's incredible that the Blazers are where they're at, uh, considering the injuries that they face this year. You know, when McCollum went down, you know, I kind of figured them to slide, and uh, Dane held him in there. He has, and, you know, now – you know, we're maybe a week away or so from a, from McCollum coming back, and that's huge. Like you said, uh, he was having an amazing year. I think he was averaging 28 points per, uh, something like that. You know, and Nurkic, they've been without him for a while. And, you know, I think uh, last night he's getting about reevaluated next week or something. So hopefully a return from him uh, isn't too far off. And I think, you know, when they get those uh, centerpieces for their team back, you know, it will propel them. And I think Dames will keep up his hot play, and it'll be nice for him. He wants to do it all now. You know, he has McCollum. And, uh, yeah, I just think that uh, when those guys come back from injury, if it's not too late in the season, that uh, it'll propel them into the four seed. Okay, I like your take on that. Let's move on to the Grizzlies and the Pelicans at the same time to wrap this little segment up. Uh, B, you had them both uh, staying uh, where they're at on current and coasting. And, Hugh, you had the Pelicans current – and you had the Grizzlies as an over team. So briefly, if y'all want to touch up on that, like I said, the Grizzlies are in the ninth seed, so they would be in play-in position, uh, considering that the record would be close, and the Pelicans would not be in a play-in position at the 11th seed. I will start with you, Hugh. Hey, if I said the Grizzlies were up, I, I said that wrong. I have them at coast. Okay, well, both of these teams are coasting. Do you like see? A, do you I like, see? I like, I like what Memphis. I I love Memphis, but you know, just what we've talked about with these these middle teams, I don't <clears throat> I don't see where you know. I think they're going to stay around you know ninth. I don't see where you know. I love Ja and Jaron Jackson. Hopefully, comes back at some point. You know, I'm I'm very high on Valanciunas, but uh, you know, I just don't have you know that many. They might go up like one or something like that, but. I don't really have them have been moving much. Well, then with the take, Pelicans, or oh, go ahead. Let let's take the seeding out, and you can continue what you're saying. Let's just focus on those two teams because they're both young, developing teams that could potentially each make the playoffs, depending on how they do down the stretch. Which team do you see has the better potential as far as what they have with the roster or player improvements? You're looking at the Grizzlies, who. Obviously, John Morant's their go-to guy, but you look at the Pelicans, who now have an all-star in Zion Williamson, and then we will still consider Brandon Ingram an all-star, even though he didn't make it this year, based off him making it last year. So two all-stars against an upcoming all-star. Yeah, probably the team I have more uh, belief in that they could they could uh, make a push would be the Pelicans. Like you said, you know, um, Zion is uh, Zion. He, you know, he became an all-star this year. You know, he's doing great things. You know, Lonzo, uh, 
I know you're a big Lonzo guy. You know, I think uh, he's playing pretty good. B.I., I'm a big uh, Brandon Ingram fan, and I just see – I just think they have more talent and more experience to make a push than a very young uh, Memphis Grizzlies team. Yeah, great. Yeah, I I like those guys that you mentioned. Uh, you know, shout out to the Pelicans. I'm rocking them again today uh, just to mention, but, you know, a lot of Dukies there, so – why not? I'm just going to go forward and, and say that I, I support the Pelicans um, just because of that. But B, let's get your take on these two teams. The um, the matchups of the Grizzlies and Pelicans not, you know, actually playing each other, but just how do these teams compare going down the stretch? Um, you, you guys, I've discussed it before. Um, I watched John Morant when he played uh, in college. I thought he was more league ready when he got drafted and uh, the numbers showed that. I think his style um, translates more currently. Um, I do think Zion has more upside um, as far as uh, a player, but I think Ja in the system they have there in Memphis when all the injuries are done, uh, I think they have a better chance of um, pushing in and, you know, getting that play-in situation. I don't know that they make top eight, uh, but I do think that they are definitely in that play-in area. I don't know that the Pelican system uh, really works um, in today's NBA um, consistently. Uh, it's having Zion uh, attacking the basket. They don't really have the shooters in place right now. Um, and it's, you know, nothing against Zion. I think Zion is a very talented player. He needs uh, a little bit of work on his jump shot, like a lot, a lot of the young stars do and generally do coming into the league. But uh, I think him and Lonzo will continue to uh, grow their chemistry together. Um, but I think it needs more time before we look at them being in the actual mix long-term. Uh, and I don't think this season is it. Uh, like I say, I think Memphis gets in, but I don't think that they have quite what it takes to uh, take out some of these juggernaut teams that they're going to end up facing uh, in the playoffs. Uh, but I have high hopes for both of these teams. They both have a lot of talent. I think they do need a few more moves, maybe bring in some veterans to work together. Um, and uh, I think if John Morant puts on uh, a little bit more strength, the way he's trying to finish, I, I don't want to see him get hurt again. We've already seen that. Um, but uh, and his Zion continues to work on his jump shot, which uh, I expect he will. Uh, I look for both of these teams uh, as long as they keep this core together uh, to do great things. Uh, Probably not this season, but uh, next and maybe two seasons from now. Yeah, I think um, what you're saying as well is definitely valid. Um, when you look at the Pelicans and their dynamic with Zion and uh, Lonzo Ball, that's something that we would definitely like to see develop because I think Lonzo's skill set pertains to a, a player in particular like Zion Williamson, but it yeah, definitely needs to um, – you know, work on the conditioning to change, you know, especially like your view of how you see him going forward with his career. And then as far as John Morant with, uh, with where he's at, yeah, definitely came in with better conditioning for NBA ready, but also something for him to, to work on maybe is putting on a little bit muscle mass to, to pad his body when he's, you know, trying to dunk on everybody or every center in the NBA as he marks people off of his list. So, um, but yeah, and then another thing with him and his team, you know, missing that dynamic so far this year of the duo between him and Jaron Jackson Jr. So uh, without him, you know, you're not seeing the full dynamic of the uh, Memphis Grizzlies there. So yeah, definitely two interesting teams, both in the West that have potential to make playoff pushes down the road if they can stay intact and definitely have the young guys that can grow with the team and, and keep that form uh, to develop, you know, and then you look at the two centers that are, are veterans between right now, uh, uh, Giannis, Jonas Valanciunas and um, Steven Adams for the Pelicans. So definitely 
something to keep an eye eye on and you know an interesting take for both teams and, and a breakdown i'm glad we were able to uh, compare those two teams let's move on to the powerhouse teams for the west um for me i'm listing the jazz lakers clippers and the suns and or denver nuggets so you know we basically want to get into the top four but i want to start off with the clippers clippers are kind of silent as far as where you want to uh compare them to last year and how they were viewed in the press and the media compared to right now with this year b what are your thoughts about the clippers uh, my thoughts on the Clippers haven't really changed from last year. Um, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are both really talented players, great defenders um, with scoring potential, but I don't know how they work together. It still hasn't shown consistently that they can work together on the floor. Um, obviously, they win games. Their talent is outrageous, but – the synergy that they need to continue to dominate, it, I don't really see it. And I've never really understood the pairing, honestly. I mean, I understand they're two very talented players, but uh, that pairing, I never really saw it, like, equaling out to, like, playoff um, success or um, a potential title, and I still feel that way now. I don't see them being that that team that comes out of the west with these other teams that have uh better synergies built in in my opinion so we're basically you know if i had to compare to what you're saying seeing the houston rockets 2.0 with the different variations of lineups as far as who's starting with james harden before he left uh, yeah, it would. It is. It's a similar dynamic that I had with that Houston Rockets team. I mean, it's two guys who do almost the same thing, and who's going to do it each play down the floor? You don't know, and it kind of a lot of times looks like they don't know. And like I say, pure talent alone, just like with that Rockets team, they win a lot of games because you just got the talent. But when it kicks up a notch going into that playoff push and into the playoffs itself. Uh, you really got to know your role. It's like we talked about in the East, like players who know their role are more likely to succeed in that atmosphere. So um, I just haven't seen that from them last year, and I haven't really seen it from them this year. And the talent is only going to take them so far. That's right. Only one team from the conference can make the finals and obviously two teams from the conference make the Western finals. Do you see them who making the Western finals? And do no, you see them no, being uh, in the fourth seed where they're at now? You know, while, while uh, y'all were, while uh, B was talking there, I was, I was just thinking about the Clippers and everything he was saying, you know, I know earlier I said I had them in the trailblazers switching spots and I had the Clippers falling to five. I'm actually going to bump them down one more. Uh, I, I think Denver's going to pass them as well, and I'm going to have them as the uh, the sixth seed at uh, when all said and done, when playoff time comes around. I like the strong statement there because you're backing that up, and that's a great segue for us to talk about our next uh, dynamic between Denver or the Suns because you know Denver right now I think they're sitting in the sixth spot, but the Suns are currently number just number two right now so which one of those teams do you have in the top four going into the end of the regular season about to start playoffs who's moving up or who's moving down or are they staying where they're at Hugh um between those two teams like I just said I have a uh, Denver at least going up to the fifth spot um well the past the Clippers uh with Phoenix Phoenix is an interesting team they're um you know obviously having a lot of success this season. I ultimately um, have them fall into the third seed. I have the Lakers uh, taken back over uh, that number two spot once uh, Anthony Davis comes back. And we all just kind of figure they might do a little something at the trade deadline to help boost them. But, um, yeah, Phoenix, they're a great team. You know, CP3 uh, and Book are playing amazing together. And uh, I expect them to make a little run in the playoffs together. But, uh, yeah, I have them probably at the third seed. And like I said, the Nuggets – 
fifth, maybe fourth. Maybe they can uh, pass the Trailblazers. I know Jokic is on a tear this season, and uh, Jamal Murray, you know, he's uh, playing like he was in the bubble last year. He's finally stepped it up, what we all kind of expect from him. So I would not be surprised if they could, uh, you know, ultimately pass the Trailblazers. I think that would be close. But, uh, yeah, I got them both, you know, both easily in the playoffs. Yeah, that's what we're waiting to see is a little bit more consistency from Denver because they are a team that look like for sure that they're going to be in the top four, if not maybe the top two of the conference uh, after last year's um, bubble performance and playoff performance. So, you know, and looking at the Suns, they did great in the bubble, but now they've added the dynamic of Chris Paul at floor general. So obviously that's paying off so far and it's putting them at number two. And B, I know you were shocked you know, before we started recording that, they were actually up that high right now and performing that well. Uh, what do you think about them being steady and, and how do you see this conference right now, the like the top the top four teams that reminds you of uh, anything you've seen in the past? Yeah, I, I took a look at this Western Conference standing and I said, is this uh, 1993? Like, it's crazy. <laughs> is Charles and Carl back? We got the the Suns and the Jazz at one and two. Like, I haven't seen that in such a long time. Uh, I think Hugh hit it right on the head, and you did as well. Chris Paul has made a world of difference in that Phoenix organization. Him coming up the floor consistently and finding those guys and getting everyone involved has raised the morale. It's made their team have better synergy. I – I can't believe it. Um, I'm interested to see uh, more actual games um, from them, but it's just like it is night and day. This Phoenix Suns team uh, has like so much potential to keep keep climbing. Um, and going back to uh, the Denver Nuggets, um, I'm not sold on them yet. Uh, I like would like to see more consistency out of them before I would say that they uh, make any serious push. Uh, definitely want to see more consistency there. But yeah, this Suns team is is for real. And Chris Paul is a, a great A competitor and an, a great leader. He's shown that uh, over and over wherever he's gone. Um, and I don't uh, look for uh, anybody besides maybe the Lakers. Like uh, like Hugh said, I mean, you can't discount what Anthony Davis brings to that team. And I also believe they're going to add something. Uh, I do think they stay at two or three. Um, but uh, they're definitely uh, a different team than we're used to seeing from out of that organization. Yeah, looking at the Suns, um, you know, obviously, like you said, Chris Paul is making that big of a difference. But you have to give props to the Phoenix Suns organization because their organization is in a different mindset than it, than it was a few years back, especially when they had like players like Eric Bledsoe, you know, coming in and then having to be traded off because, you know, he doesn't want to be there anymore. And I felt like they were headed down the same path with Devin Booker, but taking a risk on getting Chris Paul and without virtually giving up a whole lot of uh, assets to acquire him, but a player that they see fit, you know, you're not going out trying to get, the James Harden and, and training away Aiton or, or a bunch of depth uh, with your team or getting trying to get a Kyrie Irving or Kevin Durant. You know, they pretty much stayed simple. Well, went to a team that is uh, definitely selling with OKC and Chris Paul, who's definitely wanting to be in a winning situation. So for him as well to want to be involved with uh, what they have there with the young guys and play alongside of a uh, all-star and Devin Booker, you know, big props to him and putting himself in a winning position. But yeah, this just also shows that, you know, what Chris Paul um, had previously brought to his previous teams with the Houston Rockets and how they made it to the Western Conference Finals. And then with the Clippers, with unfortunately all those injuries they had between him and Blake Griffin, that maybe this is what they could have looked like as well. But, you know, they did uh, rise pretty high in the uh, seedings when it come, came to the regular season, but just, you know, couldn't stay healthy enough to perform well in, in the playoffs. But Chris Paul, he's been healthy this season, you know, coming off that all-star uh, season last year and then made another, uh, actually made the all-star game this year. So, 
you know, he's definitely on a tear. And Devin Booker, with the rise of him after uh, last year's bubble playoff, he's always been a prolific scorer, but I think he's added a little bit more to his to his game. And then, you know, with both of them able to space the floor a little bit for DeAndre Ayton, who should be growing his game this year, they're definitely looking like uh, a team to – keep an eye on and, and a team to beat, not just an underdog anymore with them being ranked number two. And you throw in players like Mikhail Bridges and Cameron Johnson, Johnson who comes off the bench, and then you throw in a, a skilled veteran and a specialist in Jay Crowder. So now you, you have a whole mix of, of what you need to formulate the right team that can win playoff games. So look for this team to definitely make it past the first round and, and make a, a good push to make it to the conference finals. You know, like I said, uh, injuries aside and COVID aside, this team looks legit and the organization looks legit. So hopefully, you know, we get to see this come come about to uh, to what they were looking at doing when they brought Chris Paul in. So, but yeah, last but not least, y'all both touched on the Los Angeles Lakers, but you know, as far as where y'all thought they were going to be seated, it looks like y'all had them around the number two spot, maybe the thir third spot. But um, so I want to ask you that. But what do y'all think about Anthony Davis and his return? Like how early or late should he return? And how could he um, prevent his injury from worsening? Like we don't want to see him return too quickly where it's a Kevin Durant situation with the Golden State Warriors in his last year because you're dealing with that part of your leg that, you know, your Achilles is very, very sensitive when it comes to a slight tear that can turn into a larger tear or a complete rip. And then you're also talking about him missing the rest of this season, but as well, all of next season. So you definitely want to protect him there, but, you know, what are your thoughts about his return and who the Lakers should be looking at um, when it comes to potential buyouts here? before or after the trade deadline Hugh. yeah so uh i thought you did a great uh, example there with ad you don't want another kevin durant uh situation where they tried to force him back you know as everybody says too early and then look what happened <clears throat> so that would be uh you know a nightmare for the lakers but um yeah i think he should just return when he's when he's comfortable you know maybe not right away when he's cleared you know maybe uh just, you know, start practicing lightly and take his time. You know, they're, they're uh, pretty solid in the, in the playoff picture right now. So, you know, even, you know, if they lost some more games, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world for them. Um, but yeah, I do think that the Lakers should uh, make a move um, before the trade deadline. I think, I honestly think, I think a shooter would be good for him. And I also think maybe another big man uh, would be good for him. I think they lack a bunch of, you know, true shooters uh, on that team. But uh, you mentioned, you know, we talked about the other day players that are potentially in the buyout market. What, what would you think about like a PJ Tucker coming over to that team who is a specialist as far as corner threes and, and defense? Yeah, I mean, I think PJ Tucker would be a good fit there. You know, have Bron, uh, LeBron just drive in and kick it back out to PJ and, you know, knock him down. I think he'd be a good fit there. Uh, like I said, uh, with a big man, you know, I think. Um, I think Drummond. I think Drummond would be a good fit there. And now today with the um, Spurs and the Aldridge news about they're going to seek out a trade or anything like that, I could I could even see him uh, as a fit there. You know, I think especially while AD's out, they could use somebody to come in and, and help score on the inside, you know, get some rebounds and stuff like that. So I think when I think of somebody the Lakers should pick up, both those guys uh, come to my mind. B, have you been keeping track with the news as far as uh, potential players that are on the buyout market? Obviously, with the Lakers not having a whole lot of cap space and not really wanting to disrupt what their team has, uh, they do have, a, I think, a couple spots available that they could use to pick up players, which was definitely their attention on, on the buyout market. Um, obviously, Drummond is a big target if he's bought out that they're looking at, you know, then some smaller tar targets and P.J. Tucker – and also DeMarcus Cousins, uh, do you see any of these guys, you know, fitting pretty well? And how would this help uh, Anthony Davis in his return back? So the Aldridge uh, angle is not something I would have thought of before Hugh brought it up. Um, but honestly, uh, a player like that um, could probably would maybe work. 
I mean, you obviously can't underestimate how LeBron makes people around him better. Um, but uh, I'm also kind of leery about uh, DeMarcus Cousins. Uh, obviously, him and uh, AD played together before. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a bad, uh, bad pairing uh, because they, even though they have a similar play style, they, it's a spaced out play style, so they're not crowding each other. So that's an interesting thought. Um, but I think a P.J. Tucker is sort of a no-brainer for that team. They need that kind of specialist, that defense, uh, defensive anchor. But I don't think they're sweating at all over there. Um, even with AD out, they're still winning plenty of games. Um, and they don't really need to rush him back. Uh, you just make sure he's healthy for the playoffs. And I don't think you really worry about what your seeding is. If, if I'm the Lakers, sure, you can push for like a two seed. Um, you know, I don't think LeBron really cares at this point in his career to prove a number one seed. Um, but uh, I think if he's looking to win another championship, which he pretty much is every year, um, I think you relax, let AD heal up properly, and uh, let him come back uh, when he's comfortable and when the staff knows there's no risk of injury. Uh, because like you say, that Achilles, once it goes bad again, there's no coming back that season or even potentially the next. So you definitely want to take it easy there. Um, yeah, I think uh, the Lakers are um, going to have plenty of options to explore and uh, the cap space is not going to be an issue um, for them. And, but like I say, I do think that if PJ Tucker gets bought out, that that's a no brainer signing for them. Yeah. Anytime there's a player that's on the, the buyout market, I mean, obviously with the Lakers being defending champions, that's just an automatic given that you know, the Lakers are going to consider them heavily and vice versa with the player, you know, wanting to go to a situation if they're a seasoned vet. So, you know, definitely they're pursuing whatever that is going to be available in, in the buyout market. Uh, like you said, whether or not it be a big man or just that that uh, three and D guy and PJ Tucker on the wing that can help contribute to the shooting, and then just touch up when you said B, yeah, they definitely have a lot of uh, different options to go through. Um, they lost a skit of games there when uh, Anthony Davis got hurt and Dennis Schroeder were, was also hurt, but with the return of him, you know, that's definitely helped LeBron uh, push through uh, a couple wins and keep games close, and then. You know, players like, um, uh, is it Mark Markeith Morris that's on the Lakers that kind of helps uh, fill in with some of that scoring. So, yeah, definitely something to watch out there. Again, with Anthony Davis, I kind of uh, see both sides. But definitely if they could hold off and keep him out even longer as far as for health purposes and playoff purposes, we've seen this before uh, when it comes to uh, LeBron James himself where he's – you know, he had been in the East previously. And um, when it came to seeding, sometimes it just didn't matter. Uh, like one of the times when Cleveland, I think, ended up with the fourth seed and the Raptors were, I think, in particular, the first seed that year. And then when they, they matched up in the second round, I believe it was, um, LeBron swept again. So, you know, great players played great in um, clutch moments and, and playoff stretches. And, you know, he's definitely no stranger to the playoffs. So, you know, definitely something that the Lakers can manage and work around. Um, so we just keep an eye out for that. I would like to ask a final question, and it can be a quick, uh, a quick gimme. So speaking of LaMarcus Aldridge, if you had to pick any team, regardless of salary cap or anything like that, where would you want to see LaMarcus Aldridge? B? Um. Honestly, it, uh, to see him go back to uh, Portland to give them that other star power, that, honestly, I feel like that would be a good fit for him. Him and Dame already have uh, established chemistry, um, and they kind of uh, would be good to have a little more depth at the big man spot. Um, it would take pressure off of McCollum uh, and Dame to have that um, – 
interior presence. It will help their rebounding as well. Um, all things considered, I think that would be the best fit for him, but I'm not sure that he wants to go back there. But that's where I would like to see him. Who? What's your follow up to the same question? Uh, I could see, I could see him sticking in state and uh, going to the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, in a podcast before, one of the ones we uh, recently did, we were talking about uh, teams who could, uh, who could, you, you know, do trades and stuff. And I think I mentioned uh, Dallas. You know, they could use another big man. Uh, to pair with Porzingis, maybe move uh, Porzingis to uh, the four, and uh, you know another another guy would open up scoring of all this caliber who doesn't preferably but can you know shoot the three. Uh, he you know he's a just can get a lot of rebounds and that type of player. So I think he could uh, help out the Mavs uh, in their playoff push. Yeah, I think that uh, makes a whole lot of sense. We see that on ESPN as far as a potential trade target if he were to be traded that Dallas could definitely use him and then, you know, work with the dynamic of Brzingis and Aldridge where Brzingis doesn't have to play the center spot and the Marcus likes to play down low in the, uh, you know, mid-range area uh, slash like back to the basket. So that would definitely work, but um, I would have to uh, agree with, with Byron. So nothing original for me to say. You pretty much uh, said what I would say, you know, I would like to see him in Portland if, if he were bought out or, or through some type of trade. And I think that would help them a lot and give them some extra depth, especially with some of the injuries that they have with their big guys. But um, yeah, just a quick bonus question. What team would you like to see him go to in the East? Hmm. And I'll let y'all think about that for a little bit. Um, but, you know, I had thought about this earlier when the report first came out that, you know, that he was open to trade negotiations. So assuming that it's a trade that's involved, um, I, I would say the Celtics. I would like to see him help out the Celtics because they are missing uh, a piece that, you know, we had talked about uh, yesterday on the Eastern Conference podcast where, um, you know, they have a lot of pieces, but obviously you don't want to move any main pieces, but they're just missing what seemed like to be mainly a big guy uh, that – is just like a utility big guy. And I think Aldridge would definitely work there and, you know, whatever big guys that they do retain, um, assuming that they would have to give one or two of them up for a uh, trade. Uh, if they were to keep Daniel Tice, I think he can work with that. Like I said, you know, a traditional big that has some footwork for the mid range that just doesn't take a high volume of threes compared to other big guys, but somebody who knows the game, he's a veteran, he's smart, he knows how to play, and he's played in the system under a great coach and Greg Popovich. So, you know, um, he's all about that winning lifestyle when it comes to uh, to uh, serious games there. So I, I would like to see him there. That would be my pick, just uh, going on a whim there. Um, Hugh, what would be your pick? You know, I would, uh, I would, have, to, I would have to go there too. I think he'd be a good fit in Boston. You know, like exactly like you said, like we discussed yesterday, uh, you know, they're kind of underperforming. Uh, I know they're the four seed currently, but, uh, you know, they're kind of underperforming with uh, only two games above 500. I think we all expect them to be better. Uh, and, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, a better big man is what they need. You know, they got Kimba, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart's coming back from injury, um, Jason Tatum. And I just think, you know, uh, I've never been too big on – Justin Thompson, you know, I've, I've just always thought he was, I mean, an okay player. I think Aldridge would be a huge upgrade. But like Tice, like you said, I think he's a little bit more of a scoring option than Tristan Thompson. But uh, I think, you know, Aldridge would be hands down, you know, a, a lot better uh, player in that system than either of those guys. And I think he would definitely help propel them and uh, give them a good, uh, good little run in the playoffs. Yeah, he could probably challenge, you know, challenge them to uh, become better and maybe bump them up to uh... – a third seed, you know, it'd be interesting to see them go higher, which would mean they take out the Nets or the Sixers. But, but yeah, I mean, just to end the regular season, you know, better than obviously where you started the uh, beginning of the season and, and where you're at now. And then also to improve your roster would be great. And I'm sure Danny Ainge is keeping an eye out on that. And, um, you know, he's probably got him circled. So if, if it's not Drummond, look for him. Uh, B, what do you think? If you had to pick an Eastern Conference team, where would you like to see him fit and contribute? Right, so I'm going to throw a little curveball because I think Boston is like the no-brain pick. But 
honestly, uh, I think putting him next to one of the guys uh, in Miami or New York, uh, taking pressure off of their bigs because they don't really have another big in either of those places. And putting somebody like that next to Bam or next to Randall uh, really makes those teams dangerous. Uh, and I tell you, it bolsters them. Like I say, I think Boston's probably the, the no brain pick because they really don't have the dominant big at all. But you you look at New York or you look at Miami, you add somebody like Lamar Curtis Aldridge to those teams, and I think their potential skyrockets. Um, they could yeah, really definitely. use somebody like that. Yeah, definitely a, a big um, breakthrough for either one of those teams, one being – the Miami Heat because of them, uh, you know, having uh, championship aspirations and them being the Eastern Conference champions of last year, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt to add that dynamic of him playing down low and, and having Bam still making plays. So that definitely improves their chances of winning and, and potentially coming back out of the East as underdogs because that's just their overall mentality down there in Miami. But, um, and then as well, what you touched on, um, Sorry, I just drew a blank. Um, New, York, New York. New York, yeah, with New York, um, having Julius Randle there and having LaMarcus Aldridge there, you know, gives them at least two names that are known as far as across the league. Obviously, Julius Randle being uh, a breakout candidate this year and being a first-time All-Star. Um, and then LaMarcus Aldridge, like I said, just being a name. So if you're a New York Knicks fan and you're the New York Knicks organization right now, you're struggling to get uh, free agents to land in your spot as far as headlining free agents. So why not add another name as far as a household common name if you follow the NBA uh, regularly uh, to uh, the New York Knicks? I think it wouldn't hurt. Uh, granted, they do have, um, you know, uh, Mitchell Robinson, who's currently sitting out, but easily, you know, you could probably work with the the swing of things there uh, between those three guys, or, you know, maybe you trade Mitchell Robinson and, and you get something back with LaMarcus Aldridge, or if that's what it takes to get to get LA, then, you, you know, maybe the Knicks might want to explore that and, and see what happens. But I think either one of those teams can't go wrong uh, one way or the other with uh, trying to pick him up. So definitely great mentions out there. I, I appreciate the feedback. This basically wraps up our show for tonight. You know, we covered the Western Conference and, you know, had a bonus segment there with a little bit of the East. But, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, thank you to the listeners out there and the people that are subscribed to our YouTube channel, Kish YZ. You can also find us under that name on anchor.fm if you want to listen to podcasts only we're also on google podcasts and pocket cast um shout out to our special guest uh your bud 36 b tell them where they can find you on twitch and what do you do before i plug myself i do want to say that uh we almost pulled a lebron and forgot the jazz but uh, there ain't much to say about them they are uh, completely dominating the west right now and uh it's pretty um easy to see why they are really blowing it up their team is synergizing at a, a big level and uh they're definitely my favorite to come out of the west but uh you can find me on twitch at your bud 36 um and i will be going live tomorrow night depending on when this uh uploads uh thursday night at 11 30 playing uh stardew valley we're gonna raise a farm and uh just chill going into the weekend uh if that sounds interesting you want to check it out um we have a lot of fun and relax and just hit the chill vibes going into the weekend after a long week of work so uh for sure for sure, sure. that's for that that's one of your bigger hitters too as far as viewers right yeah it's uh definitely one of my more popular uh, streams because like I say there's a lot of uh, high octane stuff going on but going into the weekend with just some relaxing vibes something to just kind of put it on and listen to and uh, watch just to relax you into some rest uh, uh, definitely and happy to uh, put you to sleep for sure <laughs> so, uh, but yeah come on check it out 
chat. Um, uh, I'd be happy to chat it up with you or just uh, give you a place to relax going into your weekend. And uh, yeah. thanks again so much, Dee, for having me on. I'm having a blast and uh, really uh, like talking about the sport that I don't get the chance to enjoy as much as I'd like. Yeah, thank you again for uh, returning so fast. I mean, this was unexpected, but uh, I'm glad you were able to help, you know, Hugh and I uh, throw down this show and, and, you know, talk about some great content. And uh, yeah, for the listeners out there and the ones that want to follow you on Twitch, you know, definitely get involved with this community and this channel. And, um, you know, he might even send you a shout out in the form of adding a character to Stardew and um, in your namesake and or that the type of animal uh, that you might want. Uh, I think Hugh, you have an animal uh, out there in his Stardew. Why don't you go ahead and uh, give an outro of your animal and, you know, tell people, you know, where they can find you if you're keeping it local and also go ahead and do a quick shout out as far as why we did not talk about the jazz. Yeah, no, my uh, uh, bees farm is actually called Hugh Farms. And uh, the main character there uh, resembles me. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's actually what started it. I actually, yeah, I had no idea what Stardew is. And when he first started that, he was uploading them on YouTube too. And I remember I first started watching, he named it Hugh Farm. And I was like, oh, wow. And he did it like always like a thing to show me about it. But uh, yeah, very honored there, B. But, uh, You're the real life Dwight Schrute. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, Utah, uh, I'm happy uh, B brought them up. I was actually going to stop you before and say, you know, they've already been, uh, you know, kind of not, you know, like uh, they were in the All-Star draft pick last. Uh, so I was at least wanting to give them a shout out. You know, they're doing, they're doing great things over there in Utah. And I think we should definitely at least uh, touch on them a little bit. But, you know, Jordan Clarkson, I don't think he gets enough praise. I think he's hands down, you know, six man of the year this year. And, you know, they're three MVPs, you know, I had them just, cruising the rest of the year, you know, getting to the playoffs as the first seed in the West. But, uh, yeah. Where can they find you? Uh, uh, Keeping it local? Yeah, yeah, I need to, yeah, I need to shorten up my Instagram name before I try to spell that out over there. <laughs> That's fine. I'll one that. day, one day. Yeah, thank you again, fellas, for having us. Uh, for sorry for me having y'all on here and thank you listeners for having us on your uh podcast and your youtube channel um as far as my pick on the jazz uh yeah pretty much self-explanatory i'm not going to go into it i'm just basically going to say i didn't remember the jazz because i don't have any jazz gear right now so let me work on that maybe find a shirt a jersey a hat or something and i'll give them a mention next time uh that's my fault but yeah thank y'all for coming out Everybody, peace and love. Say peace. Hey, man. Peace.